This is oh, CBC wow. Here and Now. Taking the politics out of, out of pavement in this province, but let's not forget this creates a lot of work in our province. 10,000 kilometers of roads in this province, uh, much of which needs and are ready for repair. Government pre-election spending announcements to fix up roads. And some campaign signs have already gone up. Didn't know any better, you'd say we're in the middle of an election campaign. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. Just before an election and the Premier is preparing to meet with Indigenous leaders about Muskrat Falls. He wants to talk to them about methyl mercury. That issue and the potential of contaminating natural food sources was a big part of the reason protests broke out in 2016. Here Now's Katie Breen joins us live from our newsroom. So Katie, you actually covered those protests. What is the Premier going to do about this issue now? While the Premier is inviting Indigenous leaders to meet, he wants to talk to them about science. Concerns around the project. One of the group's recommendations was to remove soil and cap wetlands before flooding the reservoir. The fear is that vegetation from submerged trees will create methylmercury and poison the fish and wildlife people eat. Methylmercury levels are currently being monitored in the area. Ball says the findings show there's been no increase to date. He wants to share that information with Indigenous leaders. The cost to remove soil, he says, is something to consider. I think that when we look at all of this, we need to factor all of that in is if it is cost uh, that, that would be impacted, that would be part of the consideration. But this is not about backing away from the commitment at all. And some of this information that we just feel it's necessary that we would share this. Indigenous groups, by the way, have been asking for this information as well. Ball says his only objective with the meeting is to share science, but time's ticking. The Muskrat Falls project is nearing completion and flooding the reservoir is supposed to happen this summer. Live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, one of the lingering questions about Muskrat Falls is what are we going to do with all of the power that it's going to generate? Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall said today that finding a market for the electricity, well, that's not going to be a problem. He says the move toward clean energy is going to ensure success. Well, it looks like now that a lot of it will go to the Maritimes, either directly or indirectly for Quebec. Over the long term, you're talking the next decade, you've got 1,700 megawatts of coal fired capacity that has to come into service and be replaced by clean energy. There's not a lot of that around. Another question, a big one, is what price that power is going to fetch and whether it will be enough to help offset the billions in muskrat cost overruns. Marshall says that remains to be seen. Muskrat is going to generate 824 megawatts of electricity, but only one third of that will be needed here on the island, and another third is committed to Nova Scotia's EMIRA, while the remainder, that other third, well, that's still uncommitted. Meanwhile, Marshall says the final forecast cost for Muskrat Falls remains at $12.7 billion. That's $5.3 billion more than was estimated when the project was sanctioned several years ago. First Power is on its new schedule for late this year. Now, under the original plan, that electricity is a year and a half overdue. Marshall says flooding of the reservoir will begin this summer. Well, it was a bright, sunny kind of day, and you may have already noticed crocuses and hardy flowers popping up, but it's not just spring, it's also election season, and that may explain why something else is sprouting out of the ground. I'm at a high traffic area in St. John's where Cornwall becomes Hamilton. This is what strategists would call a high visibility area, a place where you would see signs such as, what do we have here? A sign by the Minister of Finance, Tom Osborne. Well, Mr. Osborne has one campaign sign here, one behind me, and a third one here, so that's on Hamilton Avenue, and there's two that turn down on Shaw Street over there. Now, every day we've got government announcements. We had the Accord announcement, and we have a Premier, Premier Ball, who says he's not thinking about an election at all. He's focused on doing the work for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. But when you see all of these signs, what are we supposed to think? Lots of signs. Lots of signs. And Anthony, when you were strolling on the mm -hmm. streets of St. John's, uh, you were at the House of Assembly today. So was there any sign of Tom Osborne yes, there? Yes, sign of Tom Osborne as opposed to Tom <laughs> Osborne's signs. Well, the finance minister, he was certainly there today and he was in very good spirits. All of my signs are still in storage. Uh, so I'm guessing it was either one of the volunteers that were putting signs up for me in the last election, maybe getting a head start. 
not sanctioned by me, but I'm delighted I have the support. Well, apart from the signs, there's another indicator of an election on the horizon, big spending. This morning alone, the governing Liberals made two announcements about infrastructure and immigration. Here and now's Meg Roberts went to both of those events today and she joins us now live. So Meg, what can voters expect from this government heading into the budget? You're going to be seeing a lot of politicians faces and hearing a lot of promises in the next few weeks. Just today, the premier announced that the government will be investing $129 million in municipal infrastructure. That money will go towards improving things like water and wastewater systems, roads and projects that communities deem important. Now, uh, he also said there should be some major announcements coming in the next couple weeks from projects that have been sent to Ottawa for federal funding. Today's announcement is building on a commitment that we made with our infrastructure plan you know, a few years ago. It's uh, using uh, federal resources, leveraging federal money, but making sure we fit the priorities of communities throughout our province. So far, there are 31 municipal projects. Some of those include an outdoor skating rink in Meadows and an extension to the fire hall in George's Brook, Milton. Uh, now, the second announcement that was made today was in regards of immigration. Uh, a couple years ago, the government came out with an immigration action plan, which totaled for about $10 million. It wanted to increase the number of immigrants coming into the province by about 50%. Today, it announced an additional million dollars in funding to better support newcomers. We are on the wrong side of demographics in this province, and immigration is, a, is the best way for us to move forward on, on that in this province. So we're putting supports in place uh, through our partnerships, through the Minister's Roundtable, and all of our stakeholders uh, that have come up with uh, ideas that we're going to do. And these 24 recommendations are going to deal directly with uh, putting supports around and making meaningful connections. To some of those recommendations include better supports for English as a second language, as well as mentorship programs for newcomers. Now, last year, about 1,500 immigrants became full-time residents. So today, the government was saying that their plan is working, but ultimately, it will be up to the residents of the province to make that decision on Election Day. Now, as for those pre-budget announcements, uh, there's two more scheduled for tomorrow. The Premier will be in St. Anthony's, and there also will be an agriculture announcement here in St. John's. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Meg Roberts for Here and Now. The former head of the Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association is running for office in St. John's Centre. Jim Din has been confirmed as the NDP candidate. Now his brother Paul Din is the PC candidate in Topsail Paradise, actually. New MHA he was speaking in the House today, as a matter of fact. In St. John's Centre, the PC candidate is former City Councillor Jonathan Galgay. The Liberals, so they have yet to choose a candidate for that district. A family in St. Lawrence took out the old headstones at their parents' grave site, but months later, they're still waiting for the new one. I'm Jen White, and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. It was a lovely day for parts of the island today. That's not the case across the entire province, though. So that low pressure system we talked about yesterday, very much still in play and will continue to be as we head through the night tonight. Taking a look at the temperatures as far as highs go, uh, sitting around the single digits on the plus side of the mercury for most of eastern Newfoundland towards the coast, cooler. And then pay attention up through uh, and along the Nor uh, Labrador coast as well as St. Anthony. Minus one was your afternoon high. Those temperatures are climbing. And as we head through the night tonight, as that low continues to track a little bit uh, closer to the island and uh, or rather the province, two degrees for St. Anthony overnight. That means things will get a little bit messy and then uh, we'll see temperatures dipping much closer. Uh, warmer than we saw last night, but I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up in a little bit. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the Autism Society says it's short on cash and looking at making some big cuts. Donations are way down and the organization is trying to figure out how to handle a $300,000 shortfall. Matthew Adams has been attending many programs at the Autism Society since he was diagnosed at age 17. I spoke with him earlier today. I feel like I wouldn't be as far as I am if it wasn't for the Autism Society. And that's basically the only reason I'm doing this interview is because uh, I'm just grateful for all the support I've had. How hard is it for you to do this interview right now? Uh, really hard. 
well it's the camera <laughs> that's really this is the big thing yeah you can hear more of my conversation with Matthew Adams and his mother coming up in about 20 minutes. A 23 year old woman in Cornerbrook has been sentenced to 90 days in jail for posing, uh, posting rather intimate images of her ex-boyfriend's new partner online. The victim's nude photos were posted to Facebook and to the online dating site Plenty of Fish. Well, the court didn't specify how the woman came to possess the pictures. The accused pleaded guilty to distributing intimate images without consent and called what she did the biggest mistake of her life. A St. John's woman and her family are warning others to beware after they were ripped off in a rental scam. The young couple found what they thought was a dream rental home online and discovered not only did it not exist, their money was gone too. Here are now Cease Hair reports. Shauna Sullivan is moving, but not into the dream rental she had hoped for. Shauna, her toddler and partner, are moving into her mother's house, all thanks to a scammer who took her for $1,500. That was my savings. I had it saved up to get a nicer house for us. We're in a kind of small apartment now, so I just, I was so excited to get a backyard for my daughter for the summer. And it's just, I'm also in school and I'm also working, so it's, it's a lot on my plate. She found her dream home on Kijiji here in Airport Heights. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, heat and light included. But the dream didn't last long. The landlord claimed because he was living in Alberta, he could not show the place. But for 500 bucks, he would hold the home. And then for another $1,000 for the first month's rent, the place was hers. That was the beginning of the lie. He told me he had trampolines from his grandkids and little kid like bikes and quads in the basement that his grandkids didn't use and that I could have all of them and he had clothes and everything for me. So like he knew full well that I had a two year old child that we were going to be put out on the streets if we didn't have a house. And it's just it's evil is what it is. It's a, and when the landlord the stopped well answering her messages, ever, ever she ever went to the house. We knocked on the door and this lady said, She's lived there for years. She, um, we're the like third person that knocked on her door this week um, that has sent this guy money. And everyone has sent this person $500. But to me, it was, I sent him 1500 So I just, I broke down on her doorstep, started bawling. She sent her money to Sean Saunders. In a text to CBC, he says it's all a mix-up. He says he didn't do what Shauna Sullivan claims, that he accepted her money on behalf of a friend, and he's going to sue somebody. Sullivan admits now she was too trusting, and it won't happen again. She also says that something good came from her sharing her story on Facebook. Six people contacted her about to make a deposit for the exact same house and didn't because of her. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. Well, if you have a story for us, let us know. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at CBCNL.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Bright and sunny day in St. Yeah, John's. But fabulous. before we get to the weather, yep. Anthony, you like to dance, right? Uh, yes, ever since the uh, Christmas floss episode with uh, oh. Ashley, uh, kind of, yeah, I was inspired. So, <laughs> with, right, with Santa Claus. Where we go. I didn't teach him, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the animal kingdom, it's all about the males with the best moves. Mm -hmm. Just check out this fancy footwork. What the? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I can do, I can do <laughs> can that. Can you do that? A wildlife photographer in Saskatchewan caught this sharp-tailed grouse in the middle of his mating ritual. Yeah. It may look like a chicken doing an Irish step to you. But this is actually meant to impress the ladies. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. Are you impressed? Uh, actually, I'm kind of impressed. I'm pretty impressed. Well, it seems to be working for them. <laughs> yeah. That is Do so cool. Do not try this at home, guys. <laughs> It's not doing much for me. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, on a different note now. We are, oh, Debbie's going to love yes. this segue. Yes. <laughs> we know that many of you have been asking where Debbie is. I know I get that question almost yep. every single day. Uh, and of course, people want to know when she's going to be back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Debbie has taken some time off mm -hmm. of work to deal with a medical issue. And she wants to thank all of you for the emails and messages of support. Yeah, that's right. And Debbie posted this message on Facebook and she says, I am recovering from a health issue and I'll be back on the air in the coming weeks. And thanks for all of your concern and for continuing to watch here and now. And Debbie is going to be back with us quite soon, likely the beginning of May. So mm -hmm. Debbie coming back. Yes, she yeah. will be back. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, Ashley, how are things looking with the weather? Well, uh, we had a quiet day across most of uh, Newfoundland, but as we head through the next 24 hours, things are going to get a little bit more unsettled. Nothing too significant, but still unsettled nonetheless. And we have that low pressure system off the coast of Labrador to thank as uh, it starts to bring some of the precipitation down. Now on here, it looks not like my, or not a whole lot of anything is happening, but uh, it's because we don't have that radar up through Labrador. We are seeing significant amounts of snow along coastal Labrador. And then earlier today for the northern peninsula, some blowing snow advisories were in place. Those winds have died down, so uh, it won't be as bad as we head through the overnight. You can see just some flurry activity on the northeast coast there. And that is generally the case as we head through the overnight tonight. I mentioned earlier the temperature is actually going to climb for parts of the northern peninsula. So we could see some freezing drizzle and or uh, drizzle mixed in with that as we head through the night tonight uh, for cart rate as well, uh, hovering around the zero degree mark. Otherwise, uh, generally the chance of flurries along the west coast and then some cloud cover for the northeast coast as well. And then clearing skies pretty much everywhere else. Uh, in for Western Labrador, though, we are still looking at that potential for a few flurries. Now, that storm is still uh, prompting those blowing snow advisories for Hopedale. And then winter storm warning for Postville to McCovic. And uh, I won't, I'm not anticipating that that will end anytime soon, at least certainly not through to tomorrow, uh, maybe not even through the uh, day on Thursday. So taking a look at uh, what we're expecting as far as snow goes to, or rather temperatures go tonight, sitting in the minus single digits, so much warmer than we saw yes or this morning. Those west winds still quite strong though for the northeast coast, near 30 to 50 kilometers per hour along the west coast though. Those winds will ease overnight. And then I do have that potential for some freezing drizzle up through St. Anthony. Eventually, uh, that will end as we uh, uh, bump up above zero. Minus nine for Lab City. North winds 20, gusting 40, and then still strong along the west coast uh, of, rather, the east coast of Labrador. Nain, minus eight tonight with snow and blowing snow. And then you'll see that towards uh, Makovic as well. Now, as far as that snowfall goes, still looking at a bullseye of between 30 to 50 centimeters. Heading towards Cartwright, those temperatures will be above zero, so it'll cut into some of that snowfall. Still looking like inland areas, seeing upwards of 20 centimeters as we head through the day tomorrow, uh, and that's because that system's still very much in play. But you'll see things become unsettled across Newfoundland, so we are looking at either rain or snow depending on the temperatures tomorrow afternoon. They will be hovering uh, in the mid-single digits and then dipping into the overnight hours. 
So that's why we're going to see that change over to the potential for snow. Shouldn't accumulate to too much though, hovering around three to five degrees for most of the Avalon down uh, to the south, closer to one degree with those westerly winds. Uh, heading towards central, Grand Falls winds are six degrees, Harbor Breton five, and then some uh, chance of flurries generally along the coast, tapping into some of that colder air. Heading inland though, either rain or snow, five degrees. And then up through uh, the northern peninsula, those strong winds again tomorrow. And then the same along the coast. Those northwest winds sticking around 40 to 70 kilometers per hour. So snow and blowing snow still very much in the forecast. So let's look at your uh, forecast for tomorrow. We'll look ahead when I come back. It's an emotional purchase, buying a headstone for a loved one who's passed. But a family in St. Lawrence says they're having a rougher time than most, waiting months for a monument they paid for up front, a monument that still hasn't arrived. And they're not the only ones. Jen White has that CBC Investigates story. Right there, I'm going to get all this here, get all this fixed back up. Yeah, yeah. Jerome Slaney and Anita Whalen visit their parents' gravesite. Oh my, it's terrible. Yeah, terrible. Whalen says the old headstones here were starting to crumble, so she wanted to get a new joint monument for her parents. I always said before I die, I was going to get him one. Last June, Whalen and her husband went to W.D. Kenny Granite Company in Mount Pearl and gave Bill Kenny a check for almost $3,000. We thought he was going to have it, and he said, I should have it done in a couple weeks because I'm not busy. But as time went by, she started asking questions. Every time I went, his car, his truck was broke, or his computer was down. He always had excuses. Whalen says she finally got some news in November. Kenny called to say the monument was finished and to contact her brother in St. Lawrence because he'd be out to install it next week. Jerome Slaney used a jackhammer and chisel to remove the old headstones. I told him that I'll cut everything out the way it is here, have everything ready. But he says Kenny never showed. Months later, the site is still in disarray. We're here right now with everything here torn bottom up. You know, mom's and dad's grave is, is actually is almost demolished. In January, the family went to small claims court looking to get their money back and they're not alone. CBC Investigates spoke with three other families who have also sued the company. According to court documents, they paid W.D. Kenny Granite Company between $2,000 to almost $10,000 for headstones that have not yet been delivered months and even years later. Some of those families, including Anita Whalens, have won their case because the company didn't file a defense or failed to appear in court but they're still waiting for their refunds. Bill Kenny canceled an interview with CBC yesterday, but he says he may respond to the allegations soon. Meanwhile, in previous phone conversations, he told me that his family has been in business since the 60s and that he has dozens of happy customers. He also said that he's been ill recently and is just getting back to work. CBC Investigates also found that W.D. Kenny Granite Company owes money to the Canada Revenue Agency more than $110,000 in overdue taxes. Kenny told CBC that his business is not in financial trouble. Back in St. Lawrence, the siblings say they're frustrated and disappointed. The only thing we've got really of mom and dad is the remembrance here at the grave. And if he had just came out and put that up. You know, that's Slaney says he's worried they won't get a new headstone before June when visitors start coming to town. I have no choice but to try and get these two headstones back in their original place and I guess we'll have to go from there. That's, that's all Especially we for a cemetery mass. Yes. You can't leave it like that, like right? This. Jen White, CBC News, St. Lawrence. I contacted the Autism Center and they were so helpful and so friendly. It's an outlet or a release in the sense that before I didn't have that. The Autism Society faces a funding crunch. It needs hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep all of its programs afloat. And meet a family next who uses those programs.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Autism Society is facing some difficult financial decisions. Donations are down by 50% and the organization is now looking at cutting staff and possibly programs to make up for a $300,000 shortfall. The news has prompted one family to speak up about how the organization has changed their lives. I sat down with Allison and Matthew Adams this afternoon to hear their story. Matthew is on the autism spectrum. He actually was late being diagnosed. He got diagnosed when he was 17. So he was just finishing up high school. Um, my younger son also has autism and he, um, he got diagnosed just before that. He's 17 and he actually, um, he actually got diagnosed um, when he was 15. Anyway, when Matthew was kind of looking at his stuff, he kind of related to it a lot. He was like, you know, that kind of sounds like me type thing. So anyway, Matthew um, kind of self-identified himself. And when we went back to his doctor, um, we, he ended up getting diagnosed too. Because before that, he always felt like he didn't really fit into a group and he never really had any friends. Um, and anyway, then when we went to the autism center, because it was all new to me, I didn't really know much about um, being on the spectrum. So it was all a new experience for me. It's all within the last year and a half, two years, and then two boys diagnosed. So basically, I contacted the autism center and they were so helpful and so friendly. Uh, we went there. I brought Matthew and anyway, they, um, they talked to us and he felt really comfortable. So he ended up uh, going to um, their connections group that they have in the evenings for adults with autism um, on the spectrum. And uh, he's, he's actually, you know, he actually smiled for the first time. And like as a mom, that's just amazing. It just, it did my heart good because I never seen that before because he never felt like he fit in. And he said, mom, like I fit in. He almost felt like he met, he found his, his group, his people, mm -hmm. you know, and that was huge. In school, I largely stayed uh, to myself and uh, I found high school particularly hard. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's plenty of things I didn't think I was capable of doing until I went to the autism center, or autism society. Mm -hmm. Like what? I feel like I wouldn't be as far as I am if it wasn't for the Autism Society. And that's basically the only reason I'm doing this interview is because uh, I'm just grateful for all the support I've had. How hard is it for you to do this interview right now? Uh, really hard. Well, it's the camera. <laughs> That's really, this is the big thing. Uh, You're doing very well. Yeah. One thing that's helped is, uh, well, talking with, the, I'll, I'll say, like-minded people. Uh, it's an outlet or a release in the sense that before I didn't have that. Uh, well, I used to be essentially a, a recluse, a uh, hermit. I didn't go out anywhere, I didn't talk to anyone, I didn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. And that's changed in the past uh, year and a half. Can you imagine what what things would be like for you if you hadn't? gone to the Autism Society, how things would be different? I have, yes. Uh, oh, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably still be just doing nothing. He started the Worktopia program, um, which, you know, basically got him doing things that he didn't do before because I found Matthew would... Uh, He'd kind of rely on me a lot, but that kind of got him more used to being able to do things on his own. What would be your ideal job? <laughs> That's a question I've thought long and hard about. Mm -hmm. I like helping people that nobody else wants to help. I've actually thought about doing law, ultimately, in the end. Uh, 
getting there is a different pro is the is the problem. But truthfully, I'm not entirely sure what I want to do yet or what I'm capable of doing. Wants to help people that uh, other people don't want to help. That's an interesting thought. Now, back to the House of Assembly. A year after bullying allegations rocked the House of Assembly, a committee of MHAs announced a new policy to deal with bad behavior. The proposal aims to make it easier for complainants to come forward. Now, this follows a series of leaks and allegations about who said what during last year's high drama. Things got so bad back then that female MHAs from both sides of the house would arrange meetings in the ladies' bathrooms. That's according to former Liberal Finance Minister Kathy Bennett. Now, she told that story at a conference last month. This afternoon, I asked Premier Ball about that. But first, here's what PC MHA Tracy Perry had to say about those secret washroom meetings. Every day there was something new it seems like being thrown at us and our a new recommendation of how the process would work um, and so for us it was just a matter of trying to remain calm remain strong and remain committed and focused to the integrity of what we were trying to do which is to improve politics to improve the way uh, politics is done and um, you know i've been in politics now for 12 years in the first eight years that i i was here i never experienced anything like this and uh, this process was hard on all parties i know certainly it was hard on uh, on my colleagues as well and I certainly um, thank them for their support. Um, my, I was alone uh, on my side as, as the only female. And I can certainly say that the, um, my colleagues supported me 110% and they were fabulous. But in terms of um, the fully understanding what it's like to be a woman and, and to be bullied and to be treated differently, um, the women could understand that firsthand as well, woman to woman. Last question for you. So how did you arrange this? You say, hey, I'll meet you in the second floor bathroom or let's meet in the bathroom. I mean, wh why bathroom? Um, well, certainly here in the house, if we were here, it was the only neutral ground. And again, like I said, it was the place we could go to without having to worry that someone was going to look at us and, and um, try and attack our credibility because we were talking to each other. We had every right to talk to each other, every right to support each other, and we all understood exactly what we were going through. We all under understood exactly what we had endured and um, the uh, we, e every day there was a different recommendation about what process we should follow how we should file um, w whether or not we should go through the Public Service Commission um, whether or what section of the act should apply and as things would emerge in the house sometimes um, we needed to respond quickly or figure out quickly how to respond. So sometimes that meant talking to each other and we needed, we needed the safety and security of being able to speak frankly and honestly with each other. Anytime any member, both female or male, look for a meeting with me or ask for a meeting with me, they got the meeting and they got it in a very timely fashion and it didn't matter what time of the day it would be. So we weren't meeting in Washington's, we were meeting in my office or the appropriate office that they would have requested the meeting in. Most all the time it was in my office. Uh, so there were no meetings uh, that were refused by me by any male or female MHAs that were looking to meet with me. from memory. A lot of it is, what did the area look like? What did the buildings look like? He once created a miniature version of Corner Brook and its railway. And now these models are helping bring back his own memories. That's next.
Welcome back to here. Now you are going to love our next story. It's been 50 years since a moving passenger train has been heard or seen on the island, but the sights and the sounds of that bygone era still hold strong for many people, including Carl Purchase, who grew up in Corner Brook. Now he's lived in Winnipeg for many years, but in his basement, there's a replica of the Newfoundland Railway as well as the town of Corner Brook that Carl built over a span of 20 years. Now today, sadly, his memory is fading and he's moved into a care home. But just take a look at what happens when he goes back to that model train. Are you excited to see it again? Yeah. It's been a long time and his short-term memory is not very good, but his long-term memory is fantastic as I'm sure you'll find out. He had broke both hips, not at the same time, so he broke one and then he broke the other. We wouldn't let him come downstairs just because it was very yeah. dangerous. Good, oh. okay. Here it is. Mm -hmm. You know, he's really connected to railways. It's good to see him down here. My model railroad is based on Corner Brook in 1958. It's a large paper town. It's an area that I'm very familiar with. I think my first layout was started in 78. We lived in Selkirk. The layout there was also based on Corner Brook. What did mom think of all this? I think she thought it was interesting, but never really got involved. I remember taking that photograph there. This one here? Yeah. That's a Canadian National Mikado 282. And you custom built that? Yeah. Most of the trains, particularly that train, are, I wouldn't say they're intricate, but they're well detailed. Nothing's left out. I don't go by blueprints of things I got. It comes from memory. A lot of it is, what did the area look like? What did the buildings look like? One level is from Cornerbrook in 1958, and the other level is Cornerbrook in 1960. Miniature lights. You have those all over the layout. You have the uh, the lighthouse, the rotating light. Actually, it doesn't rotate. It just flashes on and off. You did a lot of vignettes. Little scene everywhere on the layout. That's right. I knew that I wanted to recreate a, something like an accident scene. I already had the vehicles painted and made. It was just a matter of putting in the layout and putting a story together on it. Is that you taking the picture there? I suppose I could say yes. Most of it is centered around borders. In the main yard is the border yard. Everything stems from that. I'm mostly familiar with the mill and the things surrounding the mill. It was a very key part of my life. Every track has its own circuit. The type of thing you go down one day, spend an hour down there, and walk away from it. The next day you come back, and you spend another hour. Separate things as you do, wiring mostly. The rest is history. What would you want to do with it, the layout? Yeah, I guess I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, you don't, you don't really give it up. It's a hobby. You just stay with it and keep working on it. Soon after we moved into this house, he came down here and he looked at this room. He had this vision, shall we say, so I knew he was going to build a model railroad, and that's fine. I mean, he enjoys it. He really expresses himself through the railroad. Yep. I think my attraction is my attraction. Nobody else's. I don't care if they understand or not. See, it wow. comes to life yeah. and the detail. Yeah, you, know, you wouldn't know that he was losing his memory. He remembered yeah. everything. Yeah, no, it was and incredible. Wow. And just the shots, you know, the Irving tanks, uh, the car scene, the guy playing pool in a house. Detail inside the building, Fantastic. yeah. Fantastic, wow.
Well, New York City has declared a public health emergency over a measles outbreak. And in a highly unusual move, officials have ordered mandatory vaccinations in the hardest hit neighborhoods. As the CBC Stephen D'Souza tells us from Brooklyn, people who don't comply could be fined $1,000. The public health emergency declared in New York City over the measles outbreak is targeting a very specific area in Brooklyn, here in Williamsburg, where there is a large cluster of the Orthodox Jewish community, which has been hardest hit by this measles outbreak. There have been 285 cases in this community since the outbreak began back in October, and there have been a number of new cases just in recent weeks. In fact, a number of the cases involve small children. So here's what's going to happen during this public health emergency. Anyone who has been in contact with an infected patient will have their vaccination records checked. If it's found that they are not properly vaccinated, they could face a violation or a fine of $1,000. The mayor says that this is an important step to contain the outbreak of the measles and that they're not going to be going around checking for vaccination records. They simply need to send a message. We cannot allow this dangerous disease to make a comeback here in New York City. We have to stop it now. Back in December and again last week, the New York Health Department also issued an order to schools and daycare serving the Jewish community here that they must exclude any unvaccinated students from their buildings. They'll either face a violation or a possible closure if they do. Now, meanwhile, people here in this neighborhood are reluctant to go on camera, but they do tell me they're facing the same issues as society at large, that the majority of them do believe in vaccines, but there is a small group of people that are being fed misinformation in the community and online who fear the dangers from potential vaccinations. And so they say they're trying to reach those individuals, but just like society at large, it's not an easy task. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. It's Tuesday. Tuesday, Weather mm -hmm. Whisked Day. It is. We have another member to welcome to the club, and that today is Caleb Farrell. 
Ah, All right, yeah. Caleb. You Let's guys, see. look at this photo. I thought it was adorable. So he's nine. I like this one. Yep, of course, because of the bees. He's nine from St. Albans. And that's me telling you guys what the weather's going to be. Beautiful. Rain. Uh, Rain 30 to 60 millimeters, right. snow a million centimeters to a million. I can tell it's a million or a hundred thousand. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, and look what he's put in the air for Carolyn. Yes. Bees. Gotta love the bees. Great photo. I Thank you, thoroughly Caitlin. enjoyed that one. Thank you That's so nice. much. Yeah. And there he is there. Oh, cute oh, cat. Nice. Super cute. cute cat Thank too. you so much for sending your drawing in. And if you want to be part of our Weather Whiz Kit, send your drawing, your photo, your address, and uh, how old you are mm -hmm. to nlphotos at cbc.ca, and we'll get you on. And I'll yeah. send you a postcard. Great. You even had your name on that, right? Yes. yes. Very good. So Very cute. Good. Membership card. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, what's going to be happening in the long range? Yeah, we're going ahead to uh, Thursday. And that low pressure system still off the coast of Labrador is going to affect us yet again into Thursday. So if you take a look at the future tracker, you can see that snow uh, tracking across most of coastal Newfoundland and then potentially changing over to some showers in the afternoon and that's because those temperatures are going to be above zero and then up through Labrador still hanging on to that potential for snow and blowing snow for most of coastal Labrador heading towards western Labrador not so much just a mix of sun and cloud looks like a lovely Thursday for you and then that low finally pulls away, which means it uh, we won't see any of its effects through uh, Friday for the most part. So taking a look at those temperatures between two to five degrees, again, either rain or uh, flurries along the coast, northeast coast, flurries for the west coast. And then down for the south, likely not going to see uh, anything from that. Some sun and cloud, five degrees in Marystown, minus two for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then again, that snow and blowing snow still in place for Nain. And then Lab City, plenty of sunshine and minus three. Now looking ahead, as I mentioned, things will generally clear out through the day on Friday. Certainly good news, but then the next system rolls in on Saturday first. We'll see some cloud cover move in and then the snow. So that will start as snow generally for uh, most of Labrador and then for Newfoundland, we're looking at either a rain snow mix and that's because again, the temperatures are going to be hovering around the one degree mark. We should see a change over to rain as those temperatures continue to rise. The Northern Peninsula may stay as snow though towards the afternoon on Saturday things or rather Sunday things will change over to rain. So this one's going to be a little bit of a slow mover. Shouldn't accumulate too much as far as snowfall goes, but it is still early of course. And then that system moves off and Sunday evening looks like it should clear out nicely. So here's a look at the next five days. Uh, wind's going to stay strong again tomorrow. So that chance of uh, showers and or flurries towards the evening hour. Same thing for Thursday, Friday, plenty of sunshine six on Saturday and then Sunday hovering around the three degree mark with that potential for a few showers and then clearing skies so overall not a terrible weekend. Uh, Central Newfoundland similar uh, forecast seven degrees by Friday nine on Saturday that rain changing over to snow right now it only looks like a few centimeters and then uh, that should melt quickly on Sunday with those temperatures climbing yet again. Thursday Wednesday and Thursday flurries for Western Newfoundland sunshine on Friday much welcome three degrees generally climbing as we head towards Sunday still sitting in the mid single digits and then eastern Labrador five to ten more centimeters for Happy Valley Goose Bay towards the coast again Postville to McCovic could pick up uh, between 20 to 30 more centimeters Friday sunshine and then that's the case right through Sunday those temperatures hovering above zero Western Labrador flurries tomorrow, sunshine right through Friday, and then we start to see that system move in, which means snow to round out the weekend. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. A spring storm left hundreds of thousands of people in southern Quebec without power. Hydro-Quebec says freezing rain and strong winds combined to disrupt some power supplies. Close to 260,000 customers are cut off. Schools, some businesses closed. Hydro-Quebec crews worked throughout the night and they're still trying to get service fully restored. Well, here's your weather photo of the day. Another beautiful scene there. It is nice. Great shot. It is gorgeous. Frozen with a bit of open water there. Yep, looks like it. Oh, like another toughie. Seagull on the lower right. <laughs> plate. I think you're right. We'll take a guess during the commercial and I'll tell you where the photo is taken when we come back.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, there was quite a light show over northern Europe. Yeah, check this out. Scientists in Norway launched two rockets containing colored chemicals into the Aurora Borealis Friday night. The goal? To visually track wow. charged particles in the ionosphere as they drift down to Earth. The result, an extra special celestial masterpiece. That is fantastic. Wow. Holy doesn't even that look real. Is incredible. It looks like nope. aliens are. They said they're doing this for science. It appears I that think way. this, hey, let's just try this. It'll be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing because you can see the aurora there. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's just the charged part. I don't know. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Someone's going to be watching this over and over again after the show to figure out the scientific principles on <laughs> display there. <laughs> Northern Lights, she's there. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, another beautiful, not quite the Northern Lights, but uh, a beautiful display there in the uh, sky. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that and one of those uh, birds doing the mating dance down there? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Apparently not. No. The photo is taken Cornerbrook. in uh, Cornerbrook. Cornerbrook, ah. yeah. I had a feeling it was yeah. somewhere in the West Coast. Yeah, so she uh, said that this one was painted by nature. Oh. Yeah, so John Williams, thank you so much for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Okay, great. Beautiful. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah, so uh, winding things down Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, that means tomorrow's Wednesday? Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> and so then it's Thursday, and then it's Friday. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Taking more. And then Saturday. It's garbage day. <laughs> Paid on Thursday. Yeah, okay. Recycling. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, anyway, I hope you have a great night, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Maybe that was it.